and hello everyone welcome to safer social media show here on the safer social media show we talk about how we as individuals can gain the ability to take a more critical look at what we see online and become more selective about how we use that information and how that can lead to freedom of disinformation so I'm your host, Projeti Lambenda. I'm a global Goodwill ambassador and a live streaming advocate. I started my career um, raising awareness about the water crisis in South Africa. I produce and host online shows and lead conversations with entrepreneurs and thought leaders. My amazing co-host is Alison Diamond. Alison is a sociologist and social media enthusiast She's concerned about disinformation and malicious behavior, and that's why we decided to start the show. She takes a sociological approach to examining the problem and to find user-based solutions. So welcome to the show, Alison. Thank you very much. So pleased to have you here today. And our conversation today is a rather interesting one. We're talking about partisan journalism, is it good or bad for society? Now, I guess it could possibly be a little bit of a controversial topic, mm -hmm. but let's kick that off with asking you if you could define what partisan media means. Uh, partisan media is when the political parties tend to um, kind of collaborate sometimes with um, news media outlets. And uh, media outlets are sharply divided in the news that they're giving us. So, for example, in this country, um, we've got Republican versus Democrat, and you can hear entirely different uh, versions of the same news event, depending on which side you're seeing. So that is highly partisan media. Right. Well, that's a great way to, to, to kick it off with. Could you give us three examples of how partisan journalism could benefit the public? Well, you know, there are people who believe that a partisan media ensures diversity. And that means that, you know, just as one side can tell its own version of a story, so can the other side. So both have the freedom to provide its own, you know, version and perspective. And then uh, another point would be that uh, a partisan press is seen as giving more information than an objective site would be because the objective site is trying to be fair and balanced. And so right. it may decide, you know, there are certain types of news that isn't worth um, delving into. And so the partisan press gives more info, according to people who are, you know, supportive of it, they are going to give the time to these issues that the objective media would not consider newsworthy. And uh, both sides uh, can do that. And of course, they will also um, dig into issues about their opponents that the, the objective media would not uh, get into. Uh, and they, the other thing is sensationalism. Um, partisan news sites can do that. Those outlets can be more sensational and uh, more provocative. Mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. I can see how that happens and does happen, in fact. Now, I've got an interesting question for you. Since the advent of social media as we know it today, um, what qualifies as press? Because, you know, we've got traditional media. There's so many different kinds of media. So, would you say it includes things like blogs and citizen journalism? Does that qualify as press? Yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's a controversial. Is, is that a tricky? Topic. Is that a tricky question? <laughs> yeah, and and the thing about journalism, um, especially you know in the progressive era, and um, you know when really focused on professionalism and objectivity we define professional journalism as an actual career with standards. Uh, there's a, you know, a standard of ethics that journalists follow. There's uh, repercussions for not following those standards. So plagiarism and 
um, you know, faked um, sources, for example, um, there's standards that they live by. And when you come to blogs and citizen news, um, like, uh, you know, YouTube, for example, there are plenty of people who will give their uh, report about local events or world events. But we don't know right. where they're all getting their facts from. We don't know their ethics. And the other thing is that they don't have the breadth and the width of, you know, the resources that major journalism sites have. So major media outlets have the money, they've got the personnel, they can be around the country, around the world, and they can they have much more access to information and of course those standards. And blogging, we don't know those people, you know, we we, we have to just kind of trust. And of course, people will argue that that's the case with uh, partisan journalism. But you know, comparing mm. the two, you know, there have never been any standards for blogs. No standards for you know, even me. I can go on um, and create my own new site, and it's up to you whether you want to believe me or not. But you know, what are my standards? Where mm. what are my ethics? You don't know. I think we kind of reached a point where things are a little bit blurred and difficult because, um, you know, both traditional media and citizen journalism, for want of a better word, both are filled with fake news. You know, um, <laughs> the fact that the fact that you that you've got journalists who are accredited people who are supposed to be held up to a standard, a much, much higher standard. Um, has also become a source of fake news and disinformation. Um, so it's it's a very murky waters, for want of a better word. Yeah, the uh, the problem that we have now with this partisan journalism is that you really don't know who to trust. Uh, the standard um, ethics, really, uh, the the standards of journalism have kind of been thrown out the window because. Both sides feel that the other side is being unfair. Uh, and the mm. conservatives in this country, for example, have long felt that there's a liberal bias to media outlets. And so, you know, as soon as our, I think it was Ronald Reagan who revoked the, uh, I think it was called the Fairness Act, uh, but that act had required a balanced reporting in news. And mm. once that was revoked, um, the rise of conservative talk shows and Fox News about 10 years later. So all of these different voices came to the fore. And of course, um, people who like that, like the diversity and like the new voices. Um, right. Unfortunately, there's, like you said, a blurring of what's true and what's not. Hmm. Absolutely. Alison, tell me, would you say that anti-partisan journalism promotes objectivity or not? Uh, well, the anti-partisan um, supporters do believe that objectivity is a requirement for news. And so they see it as um, not putting a political spin on anything, not trying to bend the public in any one way or another. They, you know, they want just the facts. And that's what progressive journalism and objective journalism was based on. That the, they pride themselves on thorough investigation, um, accuracy, um, that was what journalists were seen as, just like the, the kindly father, like Walter Conkright in this country. Um, I don't know who might be the equivalent in South Africa where you are, but Walter Conkright, Conkright was like the, uh, the epitome of that fatherly, trustworthy, unbiased uh, news reporter. And mm. I have to say that the funny thing about that is the news reporting that he did was very Anglo-American. So it wasn't diverse at all. Even though mm. it was objective, it was still, you know, leaning towards that Anglo-American bias. And yet we saw that as being uh, objective. And so in hindsight, it, you know, you can kind in of- In hindsight, the great thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In hindsight, you can kind of see that it's very hard to, to be objective. Yeah. Yeah. And so from a public perspective, what would you say are the key consequences of partisan journalism versus anti-partisan journalism? You know, um, with partisan 
um, news, there's really this, there's this idea that consumers can choose what they want to mm -hmm. read. And so they can get their uh, full perspective from either side. They're going to educate themselves. They don't have to worry because, you know, the, the right is going to say they're on the right. The left is going to say they're on the left. So you know what you're getting. Uh, but the right. problem with that is that a lot of people are not looking at both sides. And uh, Facebook is part of that problem because they kind of created that echo chamber with their news feeds and related videos that are linking one after another. And so they kind of, you know, narrow us into this channel where what right. we're seeing is the same kind of stuff from different outlets over and over and over again. And so um, you don't want to blame Facebook for everything, but they did kind of set the standard for consuming media and news content. And that echo chamber is real. Um, it doesn't give people uh, a real opportunity unless you're you know gonna leave the site or make some real changes on your own to see the other side we're comfortable seeing what facebook is sending to us because we have our settings and our keywords and facebook has read those and are is delivering to us what they think we're gonna like right so, right yeah so that's that's one major one major issue i would say um i mean there there are others um but you know that's the major concern that we aren't as educated as we used to be. We're not getting um, a full worldview and we're also being inundated with minutia. As long as it makes the other side look bad, it's worth reporting in a partisan press. And so what, you know, somebody wears like Obama, he wore a tan suit, that became news, <laughs> you know. Um, Crazy, Trump, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump has toilet paper streaming from his foot as he goes to <laughs> to board his flight, that became news because it's any bit of minutia that you never would have seen before. That would have been so, you know, just blatantly rude and <laughs> unprofessional. Um, it would have taken the polish off of journalism. And now anything goes, it seems. I know, I know. It's crazy. You know, sometimes you really have to shake your head when you see the kind of things that makes news headlines, you know, and I, Sometimes I see people saying, you know, and how is this news? Yeah. It seems, you know, they push things simply for for ratings, for the sake of ratings, exactly. not for the sake of correctness or newsworthiness. It just seems that we've created this beast, this culture of ratings um, at all cost, almost. Yes. You know, so people will create news um, or they'll create drama so that they can what's rank on the twitter feed or something you know right it's 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 all about your coverage so you yes. know how did we create this beast that we now cannot tame it would seem yeah you know it's it's hard to know if we could put that genie back in the bottle we did it once before but that was during a time in our political i'm not about the united states of course um but that was during a time when we were, you know, we just had similar beliefs on both sides. So we were more supportive. And, you know, at, it, when that short time period ended, we did kind of go back into this partisanship. So maybe when there's a, I mean, I hate to, to speculate on a, a war or something that's horrible, but when something huge affects all of us in the same way, that, you know, there's the uh, the metaphor, you know, or the analogy of the space, alien spaceship <laughs> coming yes. and the whole world is impacted by it. So all of a sudden we see value in working together. Um, it's something right. big. You would think it would be climate change or something, but <laughs> that's not working. So, but apparently, um, you know, if we are going to put that genie back in a bottle, it's going to be because we all see a, a common um, purpose or a common goal, and we see value mm -hmm. in working together. Right now, we we just don't have that. I know. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, what I do know is that it's a good thing that we're starting this conversation. We need to engage with one another. We need to find a solution. We won't get to a constructive solution unless we have the conversation and we talk about the difficult stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we want to continue this discussion on Twitter tomorrow. 
um, our weekly Twitter chat um, begins at the same time um, every Thursday, and that's 12.30 p.m. Pacific. And uh, let's see, 3.30, I think it is, uh, Eastern, and 7.30 UTC and Johannesburg time. It's 9.30 p.m. Yes, that's correct. So in summary, can I ask you, what would you say are three factors by which we as individuals can identify honest journalism? Whew. Um, is that a, is yeah, that a million just, dollar question? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Um, gosh, I mean, it, it's terrible that we have to fact check all the time, but I guess the best thing to do is to look at their bio and see what they state their standards are. Do they have any standards listed? You know, um, I guess you'd have to probably, I mean, what I would do is I would take a good look at their, uh, the articles that they put out or the, you know, whatever form of content they put out, um, what they're reporting on, what they're not reporting on. Are they fair? Are they biased? Uh, I would also look at a site, uh, a fact checker site, more than one, to see where they stand. There's a media bias chart. I would look at that. Um, it, there's just with journalism breaking down the way it is, it's it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to distinguish. Right. But I, I, I think there's good media organizations out there, but we have to be um, on our toes. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we I, we need to see this shift from the culture of, of, of liking and sharing to a culture of fact checking before we hit the like and share button. We need to turn that whole culture on its head. And again, I'm going to put it out there because it is what it is. You know, that was a monster that was created by Facebook. Yeah. They created this monster of like and share where people don't even take two seconds to think about something. They see something that looks horrific, looks sensational, looks like it could get a lot of, you know, likes and shares and whatever and they go in and they hit the button without taking yeah. a step back to fact check and i think that's what we want to emphasize is take a second take a breath before you hit the share button and go can and I, do some fact checking can i give you one little story yeah sure um on facebook um there's a story circulating that uh president trump when he went to Japan on Memorial Day, he wished the Japanese happy Memorial Day. And, um, and that went around um, anti-Trump. Um, people were, you know, laughing, you know, why would you tell the Japanese happy Memorial Day? And the actual true story is that he told our troops stationed in Japan happy Memorial Day. Now, now it's a little questionable whether you should ever say happy Memorial Day when you're commemorating, you know, fallen right. soldiers. But um, I, I had to tell a few people, you know, you're circulating something that's not true. And the, the common response I got was either so what or are you a Trump supporter? And that's what's happened today. If you support the other side just because you want to make sure that what they're posting is true, you're the enemy. So right. that's a consequence. That's a huge consequence. Of, of this whole partisan news. you If you don't support the news, you may be biased depending on what it is that you're supporting. And what I support is the truth. You know, it may not be pretty, but I support the truth. Well, I think that is our take home for today is, you know, we need to be more conscientious about our quest for, for the truth um, and not be so quick on the button. Go yeah. so and do a bit of research before you share because, and think about the, for me, it's about thinking about the consequences. If you don't, the consequences of disinformation, the consequences of fake news um, can be severe as leading to someone committing suicide. It has happened. It does happen. Mm -hmm. So if not, is it in view of that risk? Is it not better to take a breath? and take and do some fact checking before you share disinformation. Yep, I agree totally. Alison, thank you so much. This was fantastic. And um, 
I really look forward to our show again next week. I want to say a huge big thank you to everyone who's joined us today um, and also invitation again to join us on the Twitter chat. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. So from me, Brigitte Limbanda, it's goodbye for now. Take care, Alison. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.